absorption, which is sort of a subset of that. And this is where we get reintroduced to a number of creatures that you met last year in infectious disease. So we have some of our bacterial and uh, parasitic organisms here. We've got the little blue Giardia and E. coli and Salmonella and Shigella. Um, but we're going to talk about a wider array of causes of diarrhea. But if you look worldwide at diarrhea, the infectious agents, of course, went out. I don't have any one of the thousands of noroviruses here, uh, which are probably even worse. So we're going to try to look at some of the pathophysiologic causes and try to give you a scheme of how to think through diarrhea based in part on the pathophysiology and the clinical symptoms. And then how do we work that up? So diarrhea is something that every human being is familiar with. If not, you've been living in a sterile bubble uh, with no bacteria for your lifetime. The formal definition is an increase in stool volume. And it has to be well over 200 grams or mLs in 24 hours. 200 to 300 grams a day is about average for a low-fiber Western diet. You also have to alter the stool consistency. So it has to be more watery. There usually is an increased number of stools, but not always. And an increased number of stools is not necessarily by itself diarrhea. So one of the questions that we see in GI clinic, people come in and complain of diarrhea, and they're telling me they're, they're passing stool six times a day. If it's all little tiny bits each time, that's not diarrhea. That's an anorectal motility problem, but it's not diarrhea. So getting that clear is always helpful when you're taking your history. Is it more liquid, and is the volume greater? So in order to understand diarrhea, we have to really go through the process of how fluid and electrolytes and nutrients move through the bowel. And one of the reasons that diarrhea is so common is that the bowel has to handle enormous volumes of fluid. So intake, and, and this graph was before the days of everybody drinking their two gallons of water every day, is around 1,500 milliliters. And some of that is hypertonic food, and some of it's isotonic water. You have a total of secretions between uh, lingual, gastric, pancreatic, biliary, and electrolytes and water put in to make your chyme isotonic of about seven liters. In the small intestine, between nutrient absorption and absorption of sodium and chloride, about that seven liters gets reabsorbed. So the small bowel handles an enormous fluid load a day. The colon gets around 1,500, a liter to two liters a day. And as I tell my patients, the colon's job is to take back the extra salt and water to give you solid waste material, which you can then pass out at reasonable and planned intervals, at least in most people. Um, so the total volume of water that's lost is about 100 mLs. So you can see that if you have problems at any of these steps, you could run into too much liquid and too much and diarrhea. So if you think about it just as an output-input model, We've got input, we've got reabsorption of the small bowel, reabsorption of the colon. A little bit comes out, and that's normal. Taking in too much electrolytes in water, if you can't absorb it, can cause a problem. Too much secretion, insufficient reabsorption, any of those or a combination of them can leave you with diarrhea. So too much input of unabsorbable or it overwhelms the absorption capacity, not enough absorption, to secretion can also do this, or a combination. So when I'm thinking about types of diarrhea, why can these occur? A way to think about it that correlates with diagnoses and disease is to think about the underlying major mechanism. So one is secretory diarrhea, a problem in secretion of excess salts and water. Another is osmotic diarrhea. You have osmotically active particles in the bowel which attract water that you cannot absorb. Third is you don't have enough, is that bowel moves things through too fast. 
If things whoosh through the small bowel too rapidly, even given the best absorptive capability in the world, the bowel can't keep up with it, and it comes on out. If you decrease the amount of surface area, clearly you may not be able to, to do an adequate job of reabsorbing electrolytes. And then inflammation. You have inflammation that can mess up many of these systems. So I wanted to work your way you're through the pathophysiology of some of these so you get some sense of what these are like. So secretory diarrhea is where the bowel is secreting excess sodium and chloride goes along with it and water follows. So what you get out is plasma-like fluid. High concentration of sodium and chloride, lower concentrations of the rest. The bowel does secrete, does have the capacity of transporting sodium in both directions. And if you stimulate the secretion process too much, this can happen. So this tends to give a very large volume, a very watery-like stool. It's not responsive to eating or not eating because this is an intrinsic process that's going on. And if you analyze the composition of electrolytes in the stool, it looks like plasma in the sense it's a high sodium and chloride. So you can predict what the signs and symptoms will be other than diarrhea. If you're losing large amounts of electrolytes in water, you're going to get dehydrated. And we'll show you that there's also problems with potassium, so people tend to get hypokalemic. They lose potassium in this massive stool. It's not, these are not inflammatory disorders. There aren't any ulcers. The mucosa isn't damaged. So you don't get any white cells or red cells in the stool, which is something we do have tests to look for. The classic secretory diarrhea is, of course, cholera. And I suspect you did have a brief encounter with cholera last year. These are the vibrios, um, salty freshwater organisms. And their problem is not that they're invasive. They're not. They stay in the gut lumen. They just make these wonderful toxins. And the cholera toxin was really one of the first that helped unravel some of these processes. So in the bowel, if you're looking at the small bowel, for example, you've got the lumen up here. These are the intestinal epithelial cells and the lamina propria is down here. You have absorptive cells in the villus that are absorbing the glucose and the amino acids. Those are sodium coupled transporters. They also absorb some sodium by itself or with chloride. And all that moves into the uh, blood vessels, the capillaries here. And that's normal absorption. Well, the crypts in the small intestine, the colon, actually secrete fluid. So they have a chloride secretory process, and sodium follows that. And this is usually a minor player, and this is the major player. However, cholera toxin is very specific. It blocks uptake of sodium and chloride, and it stimulates secretion of chloride. So this is why you get a tremendous watery diarrhea with cholera. And the electrolyte composition shows you that. So you can actually measure things in stool. The lab will do it. It has to be liquid. Otherwise, it clogs the machine. Um, but you can measure sodium concentration. You can measure potassium. We don't usually do the bicarbon chloride, but they can do it. And, in, and you can measure magnesium. And so normal stool is far less than a liter a day, more like 200 to 300 milliliters. It's got, an av it's got a small amount of, of sodium in it, but the main cation is going to be potassium. That's because the colon, when it's absorbing sodium, actually secretes potassium. And if you think back to renal physiology, which I know was a while ago, um, the distal tubule and the collecting duct of the, kidney, of the kidney does the same thing. When it absorbs sodium, it secretes potassium. So if you're madly trying to absorb sodium to keep from dehydrating, for example, you're going to secrete a lot of potassium. The kidney tubule does that. The colon does that. So that's why there's, even in normal, there's a large amount of potassium. But the potassium losses are small here because the volume 
is very low. So although your stool contains a high concentration of potassium in the liquid component, normally the amount of liquid we lose is maybe 100 to 200 mLs, so that's 9 to 18 milliequivalents of potassium a day. That's not very much. The problem in secretory diarrhea is this is a high sodium concentration because it's being secreted. The colon tries to compensate for this by absorbing sodium, and in doing so, it secretes potassium. Now, the concentration of potassium is lower, but look at the amount of potassium you may lose in a day. 40 milliequivalents per liter, you lose 5 to 10 liters a day. Those are enormous potassium losses. This is why in a secretory diarrhea, large volume diarrhea, patients get dehydrated, but they also lose so much potassium, they will get hypokalemic. And paradoxically, of course, I've just told you that the main cation is sodium, but it's because of the volume loss that you become hypokalemic and because it's more difficult to get potassium in. So the consequences are dehydration due to massive loss of fluid, overwhelming all the homeostatic mechanisms. Your kidneys reabsorb sodium. The colon tries, but it can't keep up. You get hypokalemia. You, can't, you will lose some bicarbonate in stool, so very severe cases. Patients will get acidotic. You can develop hyponatremia if patients are putting out diarrhea with sodium in it and they're hydrating with free water. You've got ADH retaining water to maintain volume as well. But usually dehydration is the overwhelming one, and the major electrolyte abnormality is hypokalemia. Now, clearly, if this is happening in the small bowel, you can dilute all the digestive enzymes. You, things rush through the bowel. There may be an element of malabsorption there, but the main problem is the watery stool. So here's, again, working through why you get these electrolyte abnormalities. If you're losing one to seven liters a day of a liquid containing almost isotonic sodium, unless you're drinking salt water pretty fast, you can't keep up with that. So you get dehydrated. You get hyponatremic, or you can, if you're drinking hypotonic fluids and because you're getting dehydrated, your body's secreting antidiuretic hormone. Renal is all coming back. That's why they give renal before I give GI. <laughs> the two really work together. Hypokalemia, the reason is that although the stool potassium isn't as high a concentration as it is in normal stool, you're putting out a very high volume of that stool. So the net loss of potassium each day is quite high, and we really, most of our food doesn't have enough potassium in it to keep up. 90 milliequivalents a day at 19 milliequivalents per banana is a lot of bananas. Okay, so this is a classic picture from the Dhaka Cholera Research Station in India many years ago when IV therapy was all we had for cholera. This is a gentleman who survived cholera with his couple of his nurses surrounded by the number of IV bottles of fluid that had to be used to keep him hydrated to survive cholera. So the number one cause of secretory diarrhea in the world is infections with bugs that give toxins that stimulate secretion. Cholera is the classic one. It is not exactly a common disease in the United States. So your differential diagnosis when you see a patient with diarrhea should not start out as cholera unless the person just came on a plane from India or Bangladesh. Um, but E. coli and Shigella are the two more common ones. So if you recall back with infectious disease, they talked about E. coli um, that makes toxins, and they behave fairly similarly to cholera toxin. Shigella, in an early phase, also makes a secretory toxin. But you can get secretion in other ways. Prostaglandins are great stimuli for both motility and secretion in the bowel. So Marshall Schlafer talked yesterday about a prostaglandin analog called misoprostol, which is great for protecting the stomach against ulcers. The problem is it does other things. 
It causes increase in bowel motility. It can cause diarrhea. Um, it can cause abortions. So, you know, it's not our favorite drug for treating ulcers. Circulating hormones can cause a secretory diarrhea. Now, the classic one is one called vasointestinal polypeptide and others. They're also from neuroendocrine tumors because they work directly on the secretory mechanisms in the bowel. Um, gastrin, which in high concentrations causes the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome and causes bad ulcers, can cause a secretory diarrhea, uh, although that's a really a minor component of what it does. So it's VIP secreting polypeptide uh, tumors. Those are rare. Again, this should not be your first diagnosis of a new secretory diarrhea. Now, other things that you may malabsorb can cause secretion in the colon. Bile acids, which circulate from the liver to the ileum and back, if they get into the colon in large amounts, will cause secretion. Long-chain fatty acids. If you malabsorb fat, we'll talk about that tomorrow. And long-chain fatty acids get into the colon. They can cause secretion. Some of our laxatives, the over-the-counter things, go look in the laxative section of the, for, of the drug store. If you're embarrassed by going down there because you're not going to buy the stuff, wear your white coat. Say, I'm doing research here. Go see what your patients are buying. It's amazing if you read the box. Racinoleic acid, which is, I think, from the castor bean plant, Sunacot, these have both a promotility and they stimulate secretion. That's how they work as laxatives. Similarly, if you have a disease that destroys the mature villus absorbing cells, you're just left with the crypt cells. They secrete. You can get a mild secretory diarrhea. And viral gastroenteritis can do that, and a disease called celiac sprue that we'll talk about can do that. Okay. Now, the second, so that's secretory diarrhea. You have to find a reason that the bowel is secreting more electrolytes in water than it should. The second major cause is osmotic diarrhea. This means there's something in the lumen of the bowel that has osmotic activity that we can't absorb. And it's amazing what people put in their mouths. It's amazing what's been developed by the food industry. So the two major, the most common ones, are malabsorbed carbohydrates and magnesium salts. And again, Dr. Slafer talked a little bit about this yesterday. Milk of magnesia, magnesium citrate, that's the green bottle in the laxative section. Those are high concentrations of magnesium salts. And although we can absorb some when you take a lot, it will go right through, attract water, and lead to diarrhea. Carbohydrates, you have to get a carbohydrate that your gut can't digest or such large amounts that your bowel can't handle it. Carbohydrates uh, are small molecules, and they can attract some water in the small intestine, but their biggest issue is they're fermented by bacteria in the colon, and that often generates larger number of small molecules which further attract water, causing diarrhea. And I'll show you some examples of that. So the driving, just remember, the driving force of fluid movement in biologic systems is generally solute transport. You build up an, an osmotic gradient and water follows solutes. So in GI, we're looking for the solute that went wrong and know the water goes along with it. Because the solutes can be as actively transplant, transported um, and then water follows that and it can go either between the cells or in cell membrane channels. But it's driven by the solutes. So I have a series of pictures that I want to walk you through an example of how you end up with diarrhea coming out the other end when you drink a solution that contains a malabsorbed carbohydrate. And for this one, I pick sorbitol. So sorbitol is the sweetener that's used for diabetic candies. It's actually present in a number of fruits. We have absolutely no capacity for absorbing sorbitol. Essentially, every molecule of sorbitol you put in your mouth gets to the colon. We have bacteria that can deal with it, but we can't. So if you drink a solution of sorbitol in water, or you suck on a bunch of diabetic sugar-free candies and slug down some water, 
you may take in, and I just use an example here, 150 millimoles of sorbitol and 250 mils of water. And that's actually hypertonic, because that gives you a 600 milliosm solution. In the duodenum, the duodenum is a very leaky epithelium. These are the duodenal enterocytes with their tight junctions. And so water rapidly equilibrates. The gut cannot hold an, a, an osmotic gradient. You can't have a concentration over the wall of the gut. It's too leaky. And so water will come through to dilute this out. And I've just illustrated the solute. So inside the cells, you've got a low sodium, got a high potassium due to sodium potassium ATPase. In the interstitial fluid and blood, you've got high sodium, low potassium. Both of these have an osmolality of around 300. So this is twofold hypertonic. So in the duodenum, you end up diluting the sorbitol to isotonicity. You've now doubled the volume. Okay? Now you have a solution in here that's isotonic, but it has no sodium or electrolytes in it, and you've got sodium and electrolytes here, and the gut can't hold a high gradient of electrolytes or electricity. So some salts will move in, and they will bring their own water. And you'll finally come up with a balance that balances the, the tonic gradients and the electrical gradients, and in this case, you've still got the same sorbitol. You've got some additional sodium chloride and other electrolytes. Now you've gotten up to a, a thousand mil volume. Now the gut's happy with this, but it can't absorb the sorbitol. So this merrily goes down the intestine. Now in the ileum, the ileum's got some fairly powerful electrolyte transporters. So it can actually hold more of a gradient across of sodium. So it will try its best to get rid of this huge volume of water. And it, does, it can reabsorb some sodium and chloride. It can reabsorb some water, but it can't get rid of it all. So you get down to 750 mLs. The colon is a tighter epithelium. It can hold more of a sodium gradient across its wall. So you can get rid of more of the sodium and the chloride, but again, you cannot get rid of it all, and you can't get rid of that sorbitol. So the colon, the best it can do is get down to 600 milliliters of fluid. So you put in 250 mLs with sorbitol, you get out 600 mLs. You've generated osmotic diarrhea. Okay? Unlike the kidney, which has a very tight epithelium and can hold high gradients and has that countercurrent loop of Henle so it can get a high water gradient, the gut can't do that. Okay, so again, just to reiterate, the GI epithelia cannot maintain an osmotic gradient. It can't generate as high as a sodium or, a high, or other ion gradient as a kidney can. Therefore, osmotic diarrhea is due to three factors. How much ingested non-absorbent solute did you take in? How much volume of water was added, to, had to be added to make that isotonic? And how much sodium and chloride diffused across and is still there and the gut hasn't been able to get it back out? So osmotic diarrhea is generally more moderate volume diarrhea than bad secretory diarrhea, because it depends on what you ate. But I'm not saying people can't really overdo it if they tried. If you stop all oral intake, it should stop. You generally have a moderately watery, sometimes just a very loose stool. In malabsorption lecture tomorrow, we'll talk about carbohydrate malabsorption and how the bacteria in the colon can generate gas from the carbohydrates. So some of these people will have increased flatus. And again, there's no damage to the mucosa. There are no ulcers, there's no bleeding, there's no white cells or red cells in the stool. Examples are ingestion of magnesium salts in large amounts. So taking a slug or two of Maalox today is not likely to give you osmotic diarrhea. 
taking three slugs of Maalox every six hours or every four hours might. Drinking a whole bottle of magnesium citrate, it's a fairly explosive laxative. Um, these are the sugars that we either cannot absorb at all or can only absorb partly. Sorbitol and fructose are fruit sugars. So some kids get diarrhea when they chug too much apple juice. Um, mannitol uh, is non-absorbed. Lactulose, we'll talk about that uh, a little more tomorrow, also is a non-absorbable sugar that we actually use to treat constipation. Lactose, in those who can't digest lactose, can, be, can do the same thing. There are rare genetic defects in the disaccharidases in the small bowel. Sucrase isomaltase is the main one. If you can't break down table sugar, sucrose, into its two monosaccharides, and absorb them, sucrose then becomes, creates osmotic diarrhea. Because our gut cannot absorb a disaccharide. It has to split them. But these are very rare, and they're picked up in babies because they cause bad symptoms right away. And we'll talk about that the generalized malabsorption of all nutrients can also create an osmotic diarrhea. It's from the carbohydrates, but also from amino acids as well. So this is an example of some things that you will see on the wards used as laxatives. This is the bottle of magnesium citrate. Um, and then this is that lactulose syrup. The original manufacturer called it Cronulac. It can be used to treat constipation in small doses. We actually use it to treat patients with liver disease who have a mental confusion called hepatic encephalopathy. And you'll learn more about that a week from Friday from Rich Mosley. But these are things that we use. You just have to realize too much, you can get a predictable effect in the gut. I point out that nowadays, high fructose corn syrup is used for a lot of sweetening. The biggest amount is for regular sodas as opposed to diet sodas. And although the gut can absorb fructose, we have a real transport limit. I've had a couple of people who came to see me with watery diarrhea. And as I was taking their history, I found out they were drinking lots of soda every day. And when I made them tell me actually how much, it was like two of the two liter jugs a day. I said, I think I can cure your diarrhea. I came back about a week later and said, yeah, you know, it all went away when I stopped drinking that regular soda. But I hate the diet stuff. OK, water, water, water's good. Um, so sucrose is generally very well absorbed, but the high fructose corn syrup can give people too much fructose. I also point out that the sugarless gum and sugar-free candies contain sorbitol, completely unabsorbable. Again, you have to take in a lot. So chewing a couple of sticks of trident sugarless chewing gum a day will not give you an osmotic diarrhea. Chewing a whole pack a day can give a small kid diarrhea but adults usually have to chew several packs a day. Somebody who's sucking on these candies all day because they're trying to stop smoking and not gain weight can sometimes get a mild osmotic diarrhea. So you have to ask, how much do they take? OK, so clues to osmotic diarrhea, aside from the history, which is one of the major ones, is looking at fecal electrolytes in something called the fecal osmotic gap. Because this is you're trying to figure out, are there osmotically active materials in the stool that shouldn't be there, or at too high a concentration? And I've put several copies of this table, because I know it takes looking at it a while to get it into your head. So we've already talked about normal stool electrolytes, osmolality. Secretory diarrhea is isotonic, a high volume, and it tends to have a very high sodium concentration. Let's look at what happens when you take in a lot of magnesium salts. Well, magnesium is a divalent cation, so it's going to have some accompanying anions, which we usually can't measure easily. But it's going to be the major ion. But unless you tell the lab to measure magnesium in the stool, you won't be able to measure it. So if you take somebody who's got osmotic diarrhea from magnesium salt, 
It's still isotonic. Is the colon, it has to get diluted. But if you measure the sodium and potassium, they're both very low. Okay? So seeing very small, you have diarrhea, they're putting out a volume. You're convinced it's diarrhea. It's isotonic. But with low sodium and low potassium, there's something else there because you've got a normal osmolality. And so your job is to figure out what is there. You can actually measure magnesium. You can ask the lab to measure it. And if you see a really high magnesium, that could be a clue. This is these patients ingesting a lot of magnesium salts. Carbohydrate malabsorption, you also usually have a normal osmolality. You've got diarrhea. And again, the sodium and potassium concentrations tend to be on the lower side. Here, you can't measure the sugars, in most cases, directly. Um, but get, so you can measure magnesium, and it's normal. And then you're saying, OK, what else is causing osmotic activity here? If you could measure the sugars, you'd find out they were doing it. So one way to get at the idea of, is there osmotically active material there that I can't measure, is to look at the fecal osmotic gap. So by just looking at the sodium and potassium concentrations, you can get clues that you're maybe thinking osmotic. And then you can measure the osmotic gap. But in normal stool and secretory diarrhea, because the osmotically active materials are primarily electrolytes and the primary cations are sodium and potassium, if you add sodium and potassium and multiply by two, that should almost equal the osmolality of the stool and of plasma. There will be a gap anywhere between 10 and 50, but it's small. Same thing's true in secretory diarrhea. In these osmotic diarrheas, you add up sodium and potassium, multiply by two, and you're a long way off from the total osmolality of stool, which is equal to the osmolality of plasma. So this is your other clue that there's osmotically active material there. And then you have to figure out what it is. And so this is how to calculate the osmotic gap. It works you through the equation. Anions, unfortunately, there's so many different anions, it doesn't help to go measure those. You can measure phosphate, but it's usually a small part of it. So well over 50, like 100 or more of an osmotic gap, you're really looking at osmotic diarrhea. OK. So again, this focuses on the differences in the osmotic gap between these four different categories. OK. So the major element is you get diarrhea due to osmotic effects. You can get osmotic diarrhea from generalized malabsorption of all nutrients. And if you're not absorbing all nutrients, you can then get all kinds of nutritional symptoms, deficiency symptoms as well. The third type of diarrhea is due to increased bowel motility. Things move through too fast. There's not enough contact time for absorption to occur. And everything can come out. Um, frankly. If you ask people, you have a huge test coming up, like the CCA. How many people got diarrhea in the day or two before? You'd actually get a fairly large number of people, if they're willing to raise their hand, raise their hand. Because anxiety and can increase bowel motility. Now, this isn't massive diarrhea. It's transient. Could be a couple of loose stools. Very common. Hyperthyroidism is the one disease that we think of here because it can speed up intestinal motility in some patients. This is probably a major mechanism for what we call the irritable bowel syndrome, and Phil Schoenfeld will talk to you more about that next week. People who've had a vagotomy will dump high tonicity food into the bowel very quickly, and that can stimulate a big motility flush all the way down. And part of the diarrhea of viral gastroenteritis is increased motility. And John Wiley, uh, later this morning, will talk a little bit more about that. Um, so this would be moderate diarrhea. It's often somewhat watery. 
It can occur after meals because you get a, what's called a gastrocolic reflex. You eat, put food in your stomach, stimulates motility. An hour or so later, you're going to the bathroom. That's pretty normal, actually. Some people have it very accentuated. Again, no damage to the bowel, no white cells or red cells in the stool. Some people will say they saw recently eaten food, tomato skins, corn, coming out within 45 minutes or an hour. By definition, either you've got a huge fistula between your stomach and the colon, or you have rapid transit. Loud bowel sounds are often heard because when you move a mixture of water and air through a narrow tube very quickly, you generate noise. There aren't any diagnostic tests for this. It's mostly a history, and you've ruled out some of the other things. If you move lots of stuff too fast through the small bowel, it is at least technically possible to get nutrient malabsorption, but the bowel has a lot of reserves, so this is not very common, but it can occur. Diarrhea and urgency, increased bowel sounds, crampy abdominal pain because of all the motility happening uh, rapidly are possible. The next category is the surgical equivalent of increased bowel motility. If you don't have as much surface area, if some of it has been cut out or bypassed, then you can get diarrhea because you just don't have the capability of reabsorbing the normal load of electrolytes and water. Um, and so it's functionally equivalent. And surgical resection is our most common. Patients get a partial colectomy for some reason. A lot of them will have some mild chronic diarrhea. Um, if you have a fistula between proximal and distal bowel that bypasses bowel, you can get diarrhea. Um, if you have damaged most of the mucosa of the bowel, you haven't actually decreased the length of the bowel, but you've decreased the amount of functional bowel. So if you wipe out the absorbing villus epithelial cells in two-thirds of the small bowel, you're going to get diarrhea, malabsorption, just because you don't have enough cells there to do the normal job. It's the equivalent of having chopped it out. Now, the bowel has a lot of reserve, which is why, again, as surgeons can actually do a lot with the bowel surgically, but these can be consequences. This is an example of um, loss of surface area. This is actually pigs which have these finger-like villi and viral gastroenteritis wiped out all the villus epithelial cells, and what you're looking at is down into the crypts. And so this poor piglet uh, couldn't absorb electrolytes in water and had some secretion um, and may have had some malabsorption of nutrients as well. Fortunately, it'll all grow back. This is an example from a barium study of the small intestine where the patient drinks barium and it goes down through bowel loops. Here you have a thin fistula that's going between proximal and distal bowel. And if there's enough bowel that's bypassed and you lose surface area, you could get diarrhea from that. The last cause of diarrhea is really inflammatory disease. And this is where you actually have destruction of the mucosa. And so many functions are then going to be altered. Classic example is in the colon. This is a normal colon with a nice smooth muco mucosa. You're seeing nice little um, blood vessels there. It's shiny. It's got some mucus on it. This is raging ulcerative disease. It's just wall-to-wall -wall ulcers. If you biopsy, there'd be very little normal mucosa there. It's oozing blood because it's eroded down to the blood vessels. There's a disease you'll hear about uh, tomorrow, ulcerative colitis, and Shigella dysentery. Any of the bacterial dysenteries that cause ulcers in the colon can do the same sort of thing. Now here, as you might imagine, there's lots of different mechanisms going on. Um, inflammatory mediators, prostaglandins can be secreted, other things may stimulate some degree of secretion if there are remaining intact cells. You also get stimulation of enteric nerves, which can stimulate secretion, but also stimulate motility, so things move along faster. You destroy the mucosa, 
which allows water to, and electrolytes to permeate, but also means you can't digest and absorb things as well. And it's all of those together that contribute to the diarrhea of inflammatory disorders. And the severity of the disease and the amount of diarrhea depends on how much of the bowel is involved. If you just involve the rectum and the whole rest of the bowel is normal, you're probably not going to have a lot of diarrhea because what's come down to the rectum is fairly normal stool. But you get a lot of urgency, you get bleeding, and you get small little bits of stool because the irritable rectum just keeps moving it on out, and it's bleeding. So with inflammatory disease, these are often systemic inflammatory processes. There is some systemic inflammation. So you may see fevers, um, especially if you have severe disease or an invasive organism. Usually more small to moderate because this is bloody diarrhea or you have white cells or red cells in the stool that are readily visible. You often have rapid motility giving you cramps. If the rectum's involved, a lot of urgency. Tenismus is that sense you got to go right now. And these folks are running to the bathroom and they may only put out a small amount. So the majority of those that we see are infectious, can be viral, although most of them don't cause bad ulcerations. So it's more typically bacterial or parasitic. So of our friends over here, it's the, it's the Shigella and the E. coli. This would be the enterotoxigenic, the enteroinvasive E. coli. It's the Shigella with its destructive power. Um, Salmonella tends to be more of a systemic disease and has a little more watery. Giardia is not invasive, so you don't get ulcers. You don't get white cells and red cells. You get more of a secretory diarrhea with, with Shigella. Idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease, which you'll hear about tomorrow. Um, and there's a microscopic form of it called microscopic colitis. Since it's microscopic and the mucosa isn't damaged, you pretty much see a little bit of a secretory and promotility type diarrhea. In ischemia, if you get ischemia or injury to the bowel mucosa, radiation damage can give you an inflammatory or a destructive to the surface area type diarrhea. And we talked, uh, so barium enemas are one of the older ways of trying to look for this. If you do an air contrast barium enema, you see they get this barium coating, a nice smooth surface on the colon, which looks all really nice. In dependent areas, the barium is kind of puddled. Very nice smooth surface. Somebody with bad ulcerative colitis, it's irregular coating because this is all little microscopic ulcers. And down here, you can see the barium actually going past into the black area because that's a more deeply eroding ulcer. CT scans can also show inflammatory changes. You'd have thickening of the wall, for example. Here's again a barium study of the distal small bowel in a disease called Crohn's disease. Here, the whole area has been strictured because of all the inflammation. And these are all little heaped up inflammatory areas and ulcers sticking out into the black of the wall of the bowel. So some clues to inflammatory diarrhea are if you see red cells and polys in the stool. It means something is there causing, damaging the mucosa, allowing red cells and polys to get in there and infection, inflammation. Now, sometimes you'll see a sheet of a single bacillus, and that may give you an idea of the bug, but there's all kinds of bugs in stool anyway. So that alone isn't helpful, but you can send it for culture. But if you see red cells and white cells, you're talking about an inflammatory, damaging process to the bowel mucosa. So just as an overview of how to kind of put this together, think of, the differential diagnosis, if you have a secretory diarrhea, you're looking at infections, some rare hormone secreting tumors, somehow bile acids or fatty acids getting to the colon, and there's always an idiopathic, which means we haven't a clue. 
Um, osmotic diarrhea, you're looking at malabsorption. You're looking at laxative abuse with osmotic laxatives. You're looking at somebody taking in non-absorbable solutes, and the most common are these carbohydrates that are used to sweeten all kinds of things that we actually can't digest very well. Inflammatory disease, you're looking at infections, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemia, very rarely tumors. I mean, lymphomas and things like that causing diarrhea is extraordinarily rare. Um, the first three up here account for probably 99% or more of what we see. Increased motility, irritable bowel syndrome would be the most common. Hyperthyroidism you have to think about. Um, decreased surface area, think of did this person have surgery? Could they have a big fistula somewhere? So the diagnostic approach, and this really there is a lot that comes from history. Physical exam might give you something, but not a lot. Basic laboratory studies, trying to identify and stool electrolytes and osmotic gap can help with this, saying, is this look more secretory, more osmotic, more something else? And then doing specific tests. And we've included some more algorithms. There are so many algorithms for the workup of diarrhea because it's very complicated. Um, but if you can put it into a category of type, you then have at least narrowed down your differential diagnosis a lot. Treatment, you clearly want to treat the underlying disease. However, in practice, certainly in the short run and occasionally in the long run, all we can do is symptomatic therapy. And sometimes that's actually critically important for patient survival. So the biggest one is dehydration. The main killer of diarrhea in the world is dehydration. And so this is a clearly life-threatening problem. Clearly the, the two extremes of age are the biggest. So kids, this is why kids die in, in developing countries, is dehydration from diarrhea. And it's viral, it's E. coli. I mean, these are simple things. They should get over it, but they die of the dehydration. The elderly and people who are otherwise compromised with other medical problems can't handle even moderate dehydration. The high-tech way is to give IV electrolytes with water. The low-tech is oral rehydration solutions developed by the World Health Organization. Um, in third world countries, they're very cheap. Here, they're very expensive. And you can use anti-motility drugs to slow down motility, allow more time for absorption of solutes in water, and this can help as well. So we've got IVs, oral rehydration therapy. You need to figure out how much you're going to give the patient so you want to know how much they're putting out. Antibiotics can help in some but are not the primary treatment for most. And anti-motility drugs can be very helpful, especially in chronic mild to moderate diarrheas. This is the World Health Organization rehydration solution. And it partly mimics the fecal electrolytes. The big player here is glucose. That's why this works. And let me show you. You can rehydrate people without stopping the diarrhea, which we're often. So cholera toxin involves the electrolyte transporters. Cholera toxin does not affect the sodium-coupled glucose and sodium-coupled amino acid transporters. And every molecule of glucose that goes in takes one molecule of sodium and water accompanies it. And glucose is very stable, and it's very cheap. So they work by shoving in tremendous amounts of salt with glucose and water, and the other electrolytes follow. The anti-motility agents, uh, the opiates are the major ones. They increase the capacitance of the gut and time for reabsorption. They slow down motility. Their work, they help in many causes of diarrhea. They may not completely solve the problem, but they can be very helpful. You may need them on a regular basis around the clock and use large doses. The only time not to use them is in acute bloody diarrhea where there's a big inflammatory component. Um, there's a process in the colon called toxic megacolon, which once that develops, people really have to have a colectomy done urgently. So this is the only time you can't use the opiates. 
So I'll finish that. We'll take a break, and then we'll start with lectures on motility at 1010.